You are listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, exploring biblical prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Shalom, Havarim Shalanu. That means peace to you, our friends, in Hebrew. This is Keith Johnson with Nehemia Gordon, ready to take another peek into the prophets to see if we can find some pearls to share with you. Shalom, Chaver Shali. Atamuchan. Are you ready? Ani Muchan. Shalom. I'm ready. <laughs> I love it, Nehemia. <laughs> Let's do it. Hey, here we are with Prophet Pearls, folks. We are so excited to let you know that we are at number three. Really interesting. Before we get started, Nehemia, there's been a little bit, I wouldn't say a lot, very little. I had a couple people uh, call me with a little confusion. They said that they had listened to uh, Prophet Pearls, but it sounded like it was old and, and, and here we're doing something new. Can you clarify the situation for us? Yeah. So um, two years ago, we actually recorded, um, we started, you know, we did th- the, four years ago, we did uh, Torah Pearls. Right. And then um, at the end of that, we decided uh, actually two years ago to do um, Prophet Pearls. Mm -hmm. And we did two episodes. And I was going through some things in my life at the time. I was engaged in some serious spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up saying, look, I I just I have to take a break from ministry. And honestly, (laughs) I was I was done with ministry. I was quitting. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ran off to China. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after only two episodes, it stopped. Okay. And um, what we did in the last two weeks is we we essentially redid those two episodes so we got the fresh brand new you know prophet pearls so this is one that i've never done before we're doing number three okay okay so i've got to confess something to you so we actually tried two years ago you tried it without me no well if you remember you probably don't remember you're a little (laughs) you were you well let's just say that dealing uh, with some issues we we had already committed that we were going to do it so uh we, we, we did it and never put it up because it just wasn't the same without you. And i got to okay. be honest with you, really what I have to say is uh, you um, bring such a, a perspective that people don't get. I think I bring a perspective that people don't get. And so trying to do it without you, it was it fell flat. I'm glad we so never So what you're really saying is doing like a Torah of Pearls or a Prophet Pearls without you and... And, well, the spirit and, of it, the common is, ground, trying is, to find common It's ground. not really Torah Pearls or Prophet Pearls without us. That's why we called say. it the original Torah Pearls. Okay. And, of course, we yeah. call this Prophet Pearls. So now Amen. we only had two of those recordings uh, that, that some people had actually heard. But now we are bringing this up. So if you haven't gotten a hear, chance to hear the first two, those are available at NehemiahsWall.com and BFAInternational.com. And now this is the third one. So I'm very excited and about And those it. are the first two of the renewed Prophet Pearls. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I want to say this. We have uh, some friends who, who have been so gracious. We just got off the tour. They actually uh, sponsored this episode. And so throughout the, the Prophet Pearls every once in a while, unfortunately it can't be each time, but every once in a while we'll share some people that as a result of the tour, we went on the Iron Dome tour and people were so excited about us doing Prophet Pearls. Mm-hmm. We had some people we call Prophet Pearls Partners. Mm-hmm. And so these folks, um, um, actually James and Jen, Joe and Elisa, they're from Colorado. And what I want to do is I want to share just a little bit about them. They actually agreed to uh, be our Pro- Prophet Pearl Partners, Pearls Partners, but um, they actually do uh, something really interesting. Uh, they're involved in a ministry actually in, um, in, in North Galilee. And uh, they sent me a note. And here's the note. It says that uh, they had found about out about a ministry called Revival in Galilee through a friend who moved there to live with a family and work alongside them. By seeing posts on Facebook, photos, videos, etc., they were really inspired at the true, simple expression of love and faith they ta- they take to the people. They hadn't seen anything like it, and they wanted to make sure that we knew and that the listeners knew that the ministry that they're involved in is a ministry of diversity of people from different backgrounds that have come together. And so our friends, our four friends who came together to be uh, Prophet Pearl's partners, we want to give a shout out to them and, of course, to the ministry. They're called Revival in Galilee. And you actually checked on that. I mean, they do some work with the idea. Look, I'll be honest, as a Jew, whenever I hear about ministry in Israel, I'm a little skeptical. (laughs) Okay. Are these, you know, like, you know, Jews for Jesus or something? And and so I looked into it and it sounds like they're just people who like, you know, help poor people in Israel. They buy like... Um, you know, deodorant and soap for soldiers. So, mm-hmm. you know, some of their poor yes. soldiers in Israel mm-hmm. who their basic needs that aren't provided by the army, they literally can't afford it. And these guys have, you yeah. know, s- stepped in. So it's actually, yeah. So I, I will say me. that I had, I had agreed to, to, to share that because it really moved me. I love any time that I get a chance to hear about people that are taking needs, care of the needs of people that are in yeah. need. I have a huge announcement, Nehemiah, before we get started. Yeah. I, I wanted to say this right now. This is actually the second year that I've done this. Very successful last year. We think we're going to be even more successful this year. I want you to know that uh, as a founder of BFAInternational.com, Halloween is canceled. Wait a minute. 
Halloween. Are you telling me? No, listen. Now, listen, by no. whose authority do you cancel Just Halloween? Just a second. We've had a meeting. We've decided it's been canceled. And here's why I'm canceling it, folks. Nehemiah and I are living together, and he's actually in the United States. Somebody say separate rooms. <laughs> <laughs> separate rooms. He lives in my house. But here's what I'm a little concerned about. We've had a long-term battle about Halloween and, and this whole not issue. Not with me. Not, well, not with <laughs> I've you. never celebrated Halloween in my life. Okay, but you're here during Halloween, so I just want you to know there's no Halloween anywhere in the United States and especially here, the lights are out. Wait, no can I make a confession now? <laughs> okay. That, okay. So last year I was in China and um, I was a high school teacher teaching English. Mm-hmm. And they came to me, my, you know, the people who work in the school, and they said, we want to, you to teach the students about holidays from your culture. And I actually did teach them about Sukkot and Passover. Mm-hmm. But they specifically wanted me to teach them about Halloween. You're kidding me. I'm not kidding you. Did you teach them? I taught them in my own way. <laughs> don't tell me you dressed up. Like I Promise, don't, don't tell me you didn't dress up. Well, no, I didn't dress up, although I did confiscate like a, a like a hair rag for one of the girls. And, and now let us begin <laughs> the prop. And I wore that. No. But no, but that, that was that was just so she wouldn't bring, you know, bring some contraband to class anymore. Okay. Um, no, but, you know, it was really interesting. I, I, I taught them about that. Mm. And um, and and they were really perplexed. So like you knock on the door and you get candy and you you threaten to to like harm people, like which I mean I've never celebrated Halloween so I don't really know. Yeah, like well, this is asking know. me to you know yeah. them asking me to explain Halloween is like you know somebody yeah. asking me to explain Kwanzaa. Like I really have no clue what it's about. I could look it up on the internet, but I don't really know. Okay. So what is this thing about Halloween? Can well, you... I, actually, I tell you, like what, isn't I, this some I, pagan holiday? Well, it's not just a pagan holiday. It goes further than that, and, and I think what's really what, Sort of what bothers me about it is our society is becoming more and more and more and more and more uh, um, leaning towards uh, uh, promoting. And here's the, probably the thing that probably bothers me the most. There are many uh, United Methodist churches around the country that will uh, will celebrate Halloween with everyone else on the night of Halloween. And so it's, it's a struggle for me. I'd like to get to the scripture if that's all right. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's open up Isaiah chapter 40. Starting in verse 27, and uh, I hope that people have at least uh, two, maybe maybe you've got at least two versions open. What we're going to be doing, I've got about two, three books here. nehemiah has got the special uh, high-tech computer that allows us to quickly, on the fly, find, find information. I called it a little bit of inspiration and even some revelation as a result mm-hmm. of getting, uh, getting, getting me a look at the text and bringing this forward. We're coming out of Isaiah 40, 27. I'm reading out of the NIV. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. And of course, in my NIV, it capitalizes L-O-R-D as a, uh, a way for you to know that behind that capitalization of that, of that L-O-R-D is the four-letter name of God, yud heh uh pronounced Yehovah according to the oldest, most complete manuscripts that we've been able to, to interact with. Yeah. So my way is hidden from Yehovah. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard that he is the everlasting God? Yehovah is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary in his understanding. No one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in Yehovah will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, walk and not be faint. I'm going to let you talk about it. But first, I've got to tell you something. What's that? When I was at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, you could pick a passage and do an in-depth paper about a passage. It could be no more than four or five verses. And this was the actual uh, one. I was there for three and a half years, but this was one of the well, the papers I did. And I am so <laughs> excited to talk to you about this passage because it really, really blessed me. It gave me a picture of who he is and actually it gave me a little picture of who I am. Hmm. So I want to take a little bit of a swipe at this and see if you can yeah. bring some insight both from the Hebrew language, but also personally. And, and, and what, it, it, you know, I guess the point was, is that the people, there was a complaining that was going on. Where is God? You know, what, what was the context? Now, let, let's back up a little bit. We talk about history, language, and context. The context here, when I was in school, there was uh, some interaction we had about some scholars who believed that there were two Isaiahs. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 1 and some Isaiah... Some say there are three Isaiahs. <laughs> three Isaiahs. You know no, I did hear about that. Yeah. I actually did. But the, the One of my professors at Hebrew University is, is, is one of the great champions of what he calls... Uh, Deutero Isaiah and Trito Isaiah, wow. two and three. Isn't that amazing at Hebrew <laughs> University? Where's so, the fourth and fifth? That's what I want to know. So we're right past <laughs> we're right past the section that they're concerned about, yeah. 39 and then 40 going forward. Yeah. So a little bit of context. Can you remind yeah. us again about the sections of Isaiah? Right. So Isaiah was this prophet who began sometime around 750 BC, and he saw the destruction of the northern kingdom in 732 and 721, and then the invasion of the southern kingdom, which almost was destroyed. Part of it was mm-hmm. overrun. 
Uh, and, you know, and so, and so Isaiah is, you know, his message was, began as this message of rebuke. Mm-hmm. Repent because you've sinned. Mm-hmm. And that's really the first section of Isaiah. And then there's a second section of Isaiah. And, and there really are three sections, not their three sections. The second section of Isaiah is what's called the, um, the, the um, you know, there's the warning and then there's the punishment. Mm-hmm. He has a long section describing the punishment that will come. Mm-hmm. And the third section is what's called uh, in Jewish sources the nechama, the consolation. Mm-hmm. And those three sections, rebuke or warning, uh, punishment and consolation. And the consolation is, or really the comfort, literally, the, it's from my name, Nehemia, the mm-hmm. nechama. Um, the comfort is telling Israel, you sinned, you were punished. There will be a reconciliation with God, yes, and there sir. will be comfort. There is hope for you. Amen. And the really, chapters forty through sixty-six are the section which, which really we could call the hope. Mm-hmm. The traditional Jewish course, sources call it the consolation, the the comfort, but it's really the hope. Well, here's the deal. We're going to do this. I'm going to jump right into this. Yeah. You know, we went uh, first time you did it, second time I came up with the word, mm-hmm. third time is yours. In this verse, yeah. Nehemiah, mm-hmm. it says, "Do you not know? Have you not heard?" That Yehovah is the everlasting God. That's what it says in the NIV. The everlasting yeah, God. Yeah, tell me what it okay. says in the Hebrew. So in Hebrew it says Elohe Olam. Olam. And the Hebrew word for the week is Olam. Ayin Vav Lamed Mem. Wait, say that again slowly for the folks who don't know. I'm going to put it up on the website. Awesome. Ayin Vav Lamed Mem. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the three letter root. Every word in Hebrew has a three letter root. The three letter root is Ayin Lamed Mem. That word Olam means literally the universe. Mm-hmm. And when you say in Hebrew something is Olam, eternal, what you're really saying is that it exists for the duration of the universe. Now, mm-hmm. God is beyond the universe, mm-hmm. but we don't have even a way of comprehending that. Just before you go Hebrew. further, can you tell them what the, what the grammatical structure is of Olam? What is it? Olam is a noun. Mm-hmm. It's a noun. Okay. Awesome, folks. It's a noun. Now, some pe- he's saying it's obvious. It's obvious. Like, it's a noun. Tell them it's okay, a noun. Okay, no, no, no. But here's the interesting Person, thing. place, or thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I remember that from Sesame Street. <laughs> You know, one of the things that we're trying to do, uh, yeah. one of the things that I'm really trying to do, and which I really learned um, as a result of our study together, is to is to is to not assume that that people know, but to go to the very basics. And okay. the basics are right. those. Th- no, no, I no, say this right. sincerely: is that those letters? Those are the Hebrew letters. There's yeah. 22 of them plus the final forms. Basically, there's 22 letters. He showed that you know what those four, what the four letters are, but from a three letter root. Right. Now, just by you sharing that, Nehemiah, yeah. we're going to build people's ability to interact yeah. with this language yeah. that God chose to share this word in. Yeah. And that's through the number of things that we're doing. We'll talk about more about that later. Right. But you've shared that word, Olam. Talk a little bit about that. Well, so so what he's saying here is, you know, did you not know and have you not heard? Um, uh, Elohe Olam Yehovah. Yehovah is an eternal God or God of the universe. Mm. Now, some people are, you know, they hear that and we, they say, wait a minute. The Father is not the God of this world. There's some other entity that's the God of this world. Mm-hmm. But no, in the Tanakh and the Hebrew scriptures... Yehovah, the Father, the Creator of the universe, He is the God of this world. He's the mm-hmm. God of everything. Mm-hmm. And when it says He's Elohe Olam, the God of the world, the God of, of eternity, what it's really saying is, you know, you think there's things He doesn't know. You think there's things He doesn't see. You think He gets tired. That's not how it Seriously. is. And then He immediately starts to say, He is the one who created the ends of the earth, meaning He's the, the God of eternity, literally the God of the world, and He created mm-hmm. that very same world. Mm-hmm. Now, there's another thing here, which is a very subtle little play on words. Mm-hmm. which you'll appreciate because you talked about something like this in your book, His Hallowed Name Revealed Again. Mm-hmm. So there's a second meaning of the root Ayin Lamed Mem. Mm-hmm. And what's that second meaning of the root Ayin Lamed Mem that you talked <laughs> that about? That which is concealed? Exactly. <laughs> and so he starts off saying, the people think my way is hidden from Yehovah. But he's the God of the universe, which is revealed and eternal. He's not the hidden God. He's, he's the opposite just, of that. That is amazing. That's amazing. That's He I, is the God of eternity. And you will see him interact with history he will interact with this universe. And so even though you think your way is hidden from him and he doesn't know what's going on with you and doesn't care about you, he cares about you personally and individually. And now how do we know that? And I'm going to tell you, this, this is what's really cool about the passage. It says, he doesn't get tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. Mm-hmm. He gives strength to the weary. So here's now the connection. And increases the power of the weak. Even young men, youths, grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. Now for my verse that I was so excited about yeah. at, the, at the school. It says... But those who hope in yud heh vav Yehovah, will renew their strength. Now, yeah. Yeah. you don't know about this because you've been over in Israel for a long time. We in the United States that are listening yeah. know about something called the craftsman tool. And the craftsman, what tool, the craftsman craft- tool, what? you would go to Sears, you'd buy like a wrench, and it would be a craftsman. And if you were working on something mm. and it broke, you could literally take it back to Sears and exchange it for a new one. Now, for the Hebrew mm. language... Tell us about the word 
to renew their strength. Tell us about the yeah. word about renew. So there's this phrase, and it's really interesting because it only appears twice in the entire Tanakh, mm -hmm. and it's in uh, this verse and the next verse. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's not a coincidence. Um, the two passages are tied by this phrase. Um, it says, those who hope in Yehovah literally will change strength. Mm -hmm. And the image there, it's translated as renew strength. Mm -hmm. But really, the image there is my battery is run out. I'm changing the battery. Do you know anything about this? Have you ever experienced it? Have you, you ever know, had a time? I, I have. Have you well, ever so had a two, time? So, and, and, okay. And, so where this, the, is, this to me is powerful because yeah. two years ago, we did this passage not this passage, but we started doing yep. the prophet pearls. We quit before we got here to this one. And we quit before we got here, and it's appropriate. Because now that I can go forward and do this, I've replaced my strength. I've mm. taken out the broken battery and said, Yehovah, I need more strength. Mm. And after two years, he's given it to me. And maybe for such a time as this, uh, we didn't. I didn't get to this passage. Um, but really, what a powerful God Isn't we have. That Isn't that amazing? amazing? Wait, hold I'll on. Be Wait, no, let me you. back up. Wait, let me I, back up. Yeah, Go ahead. Two, so two years ago... After we did the second episode, there were some things going on in my life, and I really was, you know, I was uh, I was done. And I'll be honest, with you, can I be totally honest? I wasn't just done with ministry, I was done with the world. Mm. I ran off to China, and, uh, you know, and now after two years, my strength is renewed. <laughs> and I, you know, and, and here it is, those who hope in Yehovah... They will replace, they will change their strength. He's going to give them new strength. You know, it's almost like this. It's almost like instead of you having to go to the store, because I've hope in him, he just comes to your house and says, let me exchange that for you. Let me take what you wow. don't have and give it to you. Now, here's the next part that I that I really caught my attention way yeah. back some years ago, 1991, 1992. It says, you would expect it to be the other way. They will soar on wings with Legos. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. It almost seems anticlimactic. However... Mm -hmm. When you look at the context of what's happening, who's Isaiah speaking to? Who's hearing this message when he's speaking? Where are these people at when they get this message? I mean, what's the context? That's a really good question. That's a great question. <laughs> That's a great question. And right. so one of the things so, that I was... So what is the answer? And, so, and the answer is we don't entirely know. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, is this something for Isaiah's time or is this mm -hmm. something for a future time? It's, if it's for Isaiah's time, that's a no-brainer. The issue here is they've been invaded by the Assyrians. Mm -hmm. The Assyrians are um, have surrounded Jerusalem. There's this great Assyrian inscription from the king of the emperor of Assyria, where he, he talks about how he has Hezekiah shut up like a bird in a cage, mm. meaning he's besieged Jerusalem, and and he's shut up. He can't get out. And so the image here is we're done. I mean, we're so sur we're surrounded by the superpower. Mm. The superpower of the day was Assyria. Mm. How on earth could this little tiny kingdom, this little you know, little country, mm. uh, one of the smallest countries in the world at the time and to this very day, mm. surrounded by this 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 mega superpower which had swept through the entire Middle East, conquered everything in its path, and this one lone prophet is telling the people. Do not give up. Trust in Yehovah. Have hope. I want to know if I can venture out and say that Isaiah was speaking for then. Isaiah was speaking for now. Amen. And Isaiah is speaking for the future. And it wasn't Isaiah. Amen. The everlasting God. The Olam. The Elohe Olam. The God on, of eternity. The one who already... What is his name? Hayahove Yehiyeh. I was. I am. I shall be. He yeah. was like saying, look, Isaiah, this is for, this is for then. And... I mean, isn't yeah. that the part that's so powerful? Yeah. I mean, and for those who, who aren't aware, that's actually the meaning of the Father's name, Yehovah. Hayah, he was. Hoveh, he is. Yehieh, he will be. And there's a grammatical base for that, which I love when we talk about, but let's move on. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Here we go, Nehemiah. We're about to get into a section where I think you're going to probably need the napkin for a little dabbing of the sweat. I'm actually excited about it. Can, can I just say one last thing about yes. this phrase at the end of 31? It says, they will run and they will not be uh, tired. They will go and they will not be uh, weary. And, and you know, so it's my understanding, Keith, that you actually did some kind of running earlier. In your, in what do you your, mean some kind of running? No, <laughs> yeah, you were some kind a, of little runner no, in high school or college or something. In high like? school, I was a, I mean, in college, I was a state champion. I went to the University of Minnesota. Go Gophers. I was in the top, I was in the Big Ten finals of the 300 meters. No I mean, idea I, what that no. means. Is that a big thing? Is that what are you talking thing? about? It's one of the toughest races. So you were a all. runner, right? Yeah, I was a so sprinter from, and a sprinter. hurdler. Okay. And yeah, absolutely. So from your experience as a runner, I, I've only read about this because, as you may have guessed, I've never really been an athlete. I would have never guessed it. The only athletics I've done is with books. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so it's my understanding from what I've read that runners will, um, they'll carb up the day before a race. Yep. And uh, In fact, we had training table 
back in yeah. those times when we'd go travel to a city. Yeah. We got a big race the next day. What would they have? Pasta, pancakes, right. everything you can imagine. All right. the carbs you want. So you get all these carbs. And what I understand now after reading books is that it, it uh, builds up your glycogen stores. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you run and you run and you run. Now, in your case, you are a sprinter, so it's a different issue. But if you're a marathon runner or a long-distance runner, it's my understanding after about two hours, people, will, even the top athletes of the world, they'll what's called hit a wall. Isn't mm -hmm. that right? Or yep. some people call it bonking. Absolutely. So they'll they'll and they're just and what happens is uh, from again from the books I've read, and there's a great uh, scholar out there named uh, Professor Tim Noakes who's done some amazing work on this. Mm -hmm. He's actually wrote the book on running. Mm -hmm. And he talks, wrote in like the 80s about how you need to carb up. Mm -hmm. And with some new research, he actually went on television and took those pages from his book and ripped them out. Mm -hmm. And what he found out is that um, when you carb up, what you're doing is you're building up your glucose and your glycogen stores and you have about 2,500 calories you can burn. Mm -hmm. um, and you're maximizing that. But if you become keto adapted, look that up keto adapted mm -hmm. then you have as much as 40,000 calories mm -hmm. and you'll be like the man in this verse well you'll run and you will not be tired you'll mm -hmm. walk and you will not be weary mm -hmm. you can you know there's there's a, these guys from Kenya who are like from this one particular group who are like some of the best runners in the world and they are you know naturally in their culture keto adapted um, mm -hmm. without really understanding the science they know what to do and these guys can run a whole marathon without you know drinking anything but water and without uh, actually one guy does it without drinking any water and without um without you know sucking on those um you know sugar gels they have now for the runners and so when i read this i get so excited that you know um i went through this difficult time and i could have given up and I, i'll be honest with you i was close to giving up but i kept walking and it was my hope in yehovah and um he wouldn't let me stop running I mean, you know, and i was able to keep walking and even though i i needed a break I was able to push through and push through that that you know that zone. Would you and give me a little? Hallelujah. Let me get a little grace on this because I yeah. think there's a lot of people that are listening, and in their spiritual journey, mm -hmm. uh, some of them are early in the process where they're yeah. soaring. You know, it's new, they're it's exciting. Like the they're, oh, they're happy, excited. Some of them are in the run phase where they're like, "Hey, I got all this new information." But I know there's a lot. I got some friends out there. I, I call them uh, the two witnesses. They're in the walk phase. They've been walking okay. for a long 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 time yeah and i'm getting so old i'm starting to say now i've been walking for a long time and it's really during the walking now i can understand why that's the, the climax of the passage it's mm. the long walk yeah where you've got to have that right. time where you stop so i want to shout out to all you guys that are soaring those that are running but especially for those that are walking keep on walking while we keep on reading okay Amen. all right here we go isaiah 41 now i'm gonna get you a kleenex yo folks we're together Nehemi and i are, are together in fact um, it's really been interesting because we're now living in the same house, uh, being able to do this. We've got this setup, you guys. It's really kind of funny. We're in this setup. It's not funny. It's <laughs> in fact, I'm just going to confess right now. We, we had a crisis. It's really and, not and, funny. And, and the crisis is I'm operating on this old um, uh, little iPad that's cracked. And uh, we tried to do this uh, program earlier today. <laughs> and uh, it didn't record. And so what I did. We did is, the whole program. No, no. <laughs> And I say, okay, now can I download the file? And, and there's no file. Yeah, he's got a so, four-year-old iPad too. Yes, yeah, it's, it's cracked. But what I did is, the 21st I, 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 went, I went, I went downstairs and I and I and I and I, and I cooked your steak. Um, did I not? Yeah, a ketogenic friendly steak, so that we could keep on working. <laughs> now we've got the fuel. And now we got the fuel. Here we go. Isaiah 41. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew. And there's again. There they renew again. strength. Yeah. They renew their strength. And again, those words just jump right off the page. Switch out the power. Switch out the power. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. Now, Nehemiah, what we're going to do is we're going to go to a section. And I'm going to go ahead and read the section and hold off and come back to to the beginning. Can I just go to the section? Read read one through, one through four seven. or one through seven? Let's do one through seven because, you know, in, in the Hebrew text, that's one single prophetic unit. Okay, here we go for one one prophetic unit. And, and again, the chapters... I'm sorry, it's two through seven. I, I made uh, a mistake. Well, in the Hebrew, it's one through seven. You mean to say you just you read got verse one. one and you got no, two? No, no, you got a one, two. You got a two. I read here, be, be silent. silent. That's yeah. verse one. Yeah. So you're. This is verse two. Right. And Meaning, what are you saying? Is one through seven in the Hebrew is one prophetic unit. Okay. Here we go. And one the point is the cha the chapters they don't represent the the prophecies mm -hmm. of Isaiah mm -hmm. in the Hebrew text. There are these spaces and they yes. indicate what the what the parameters of some of the prophetic units are. Okay. Here we go, folks. And by that I mean he stood in a public square and he preached verses one through seven. I think he did on one particular day. Verse eight might have been a different year. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> Last week, if you missed it. Here we go. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? It's hard for me to keep reading. 
He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to windblown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves unset, unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, Yehovah, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am he. We'll come back to that. The islands have seen it in fear. The ends of the earth tremble. They approach and come forward. Each helps the other and says to his brother, be strong. <laughs> We can come back to that. The craftsman encourages the goldsmith and he smooths uh, with the hammer, spurs him on who strikes the anvil. He says of the welding, it is good. He nails down the idol so it will not topple. You just took a sip of coffee. So I'm going to get you before you get to speak <laughs> because Nehemiah, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. Are you ready? Sure. I want to put you on the spot and I want to put even the, some ancient Jewish commentators on the yeah. spot. When we're reading this, he says, yeah. who has stirred up one from the east calling him in righteousness to his service? Yeah. Two weeks ago, we talked about the Evan. We said that's not, certainly Assuming. anyone that would read yeah. it, we'd have to understand kind of. Last week, we <clears throat> talked about David, the promise to David, personally, to David and to his seed. Yeah. We and I, you and I agreed. Not just personally, the promise to David, then yes, being, come on being a symbol for all of Israel. Now for this one. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness yeah. to his service? So what do your, from your people, like you yeah. say to me, your people, Keith. How about your people? What do they do about this? Well, let me let me start with when I read this verse um, in preparation for this this um, recording. I you know read verses one through seven. I stopped and I said, okay, you know I've read this many times before, but if I'm totally honest, I have no idea what this is talking about. And I said, okay, since I don't know what this is talking about, it's not obvious. Now I need to go look at the commentaries and see how this has traditionally and historically been interpreted. Um, and uh, and I should point out that in the Hebrew, it's actually far more complicated than it is in the English. <laughs> there are things in the English that you could just, you know, oh, well, we know what that says. But Trust we're... him on that, friends. <laughs> and, and we could actually spend the whole time just like, you know, the we sword. Could, we could the... make this whole... Anyway, yes. really, just in one or two words here, we could say, okay, well, we, you translated that so simply and easily, but it's not really clear what, what any of it means, um, certainly in the first few verses. And so, you know, so, the, so then the question became, okay, how has this been historically interpreted? And I looked in... In the earliest Jewish sources, and what I found was that in the earliest Jewish sources, this was interpreted as referring to Abraham. When it says, he, who, has, uh, who has he um, aroused in the east, literally woken up? Um, he ha literally, it says, uh, righteousness, he has called him to his feet. And the interesting thing is, I was looking at one modern day uh, Hebrew linguist, one of the top, top experts in the Hebrew language, a professor in Israel named David Yellen, who has now passed away. Um, and he was actually saying that this word tzedek, righteousness, in the context of Isaiah, and particularly these chapters of Isaiah in, in this part of the, the section, that the word righteousness very often can be translated as salvation. Mm. And he actually shows how there's word, places in the Tanakh, in, in this section of Isaiah in particular, where there's a parallel between tzedek, salvation, or tzedakah, yes. righteousness, or excuse me, tzedek, righteous, or righteousness, and the word Yeshua, salvation. Mm. And so we really can translate this. Who is he woken up from the east? Uh, he calls him in, in, in salvation or for salvation to his foot. Um, wow. You know, mm. So who is God calling to stand next to him at, at his foot? And, and so in the ancient Jewish sources that I looked at, they were pretty much unanimous that this is referring to Abraham. Mm hmm now, why Abraham being called from the east? Well, he was from Aramea. He was from, and you know, verse eight says he was from Ur of the Casti. Yeah. Right, except for verse 8 is a different prophecy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meaning, in Hebrew, no one really disputes that verse 8 is a different prophecy. And you could say, okay, well, they're related prophecies. That's where they're next to each other. But well, if maybe I need, they're if not I need it to fit, I need it to fit, then you can I'm going to, to fit. You could force sure. to fit. So the question I had when I was reading this, okay, are there any other explanations of this? Because I can't make head or tail of it. It's saying he's he's chasing people, and they're saying, "Okay, that's the four kings," and I'm like, "Really? That this is Abraham? Like, if I only if I stood in the public square in Jerusalem and heard Isaiah prophesying just verses one through seven, I don't believe I'd ever come up with this being Abraham. I just can't believe. It. Really, hmm. Abraham is is like where do you get an Abraham in this passage? In verse eight, sure, he's mentioned by name, and that's the reason that this was chosen for the portion you know that that parallels the Torah portion." Um, probably the interpretation of this being Abraham is why they chose it. Because there it's Abraham being called from the east, and here it's mm -hmm. saying, but that was in a relatively late period, meaning long after Moses mm -hmm. and long after Isaiah. So in the time of Isaiah, what did this mean? And here's the interesting thing. In, in, in later periods, in, in the 12th and 13th century, there were these other rabbis who went back and they said, okay, that's what our ancient sages said, the ancient rabbis of the Talmud. 
But what does it really mean? And one of those rabbis suggested that, well, of course it's not Abraham, because Abraham's not even you know, mentioned in the verse. Mm-hmm. And you really have to stretch it. You know, he's chasing people, and, and you know, Abraham, at one time in his life, he did that. Um, and then, you know, we have here about his, his sword will be like, you know, uh, uh, where is this? His sword will be like dust, or will turn them into dust. Like, that's Abraham? Come on. And so one explanation um, from the later rabbis is that this actually refers to Cyrus, which mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense because in Isaiah 45, he mentions Cyrus by name, mm-hmm. and Cyrus is from the east. Cyrus was from Persia, um, the east relative to Israel. Um, other rabbis said, well, no, wait a minute. Cyrus was later, and Cyrus mentions by, is mentioned by name. It's one thing. But what about, you know, in the period of Isaiah, we have, you know, good candidates that, that Isaiah's people would have been interested in. The Assyrians, who were right there at the doorstep, and the Babylonians, well, who came a few years later, who Isaiah, by name, predicted their coming. So, and, and they were only a few years off. So it's all. So here we have four candidates. Think about it. We've got Abraham, Cyrus, the Assyrians, and, and the Babylonians. What really surprised me as I was looking in these sources, and I admit I didn't look in every source, but in the many sources I did look in, I didn't find a single Jewish source that suggested this is referring to the future King Messiah from the line of David. I was going to say we, That's have, we, have, we have five choices. That's my yeah. choice. My choice is that 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 we're talking about uh, the King, the Messiah, the yeah. one who will who, who clearly, if you're speaking of the future, which yeah. both you and I are waiting for. Yeah. Amen. Okay. In other words, in other words, when that happens, that he that he comes and does that. We could read this verse in that situation, and they would right. be pointing to him and say, that's what he does. Well, here's what I can say with confidence. So if you go back to verse 7 at the end, we've got you know these idolaters who are building their idols, mm-hmm. and they're you know putting nails so they don't fall over. And these are the enemies that this person from the east is fighting, mm-hmm. which again tells me, uh, really, you know, Abraham is fighting idolaters? I, I guess, but idolaters didn't really fit into the story. Yeah, I mean, they weren't mentioned, they weren't a major part of the story. It was that so, his... His nephew was kidnapped. That was the issue. They're not, Id- not so, idols. So no conspiracy, though, Nehemiah, question. Yeah. So so the, the Ju- ancient Jewish commentators, many of them, majority of them, would not see this as messianic. Passage. I don't know any However, that, let there me may have been you, some that let did, me but, ask it, you a but question. it wasn't the main interpretation. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Yeah. After all of that study, after yeah. all that looking, if I said to you, I think there's a fifth option, and you say there's a fifth option, I say to you, I'm going to stand on this as a, a, a messianic a, a picture. Would you argue it? Here's what's a little surprising to me, that there aren't more ancient Jewish sources that did say that, because our image of the Messiah in, in Jewish history, and I think this is borne out from, from the prophets, um, is that we have this figure who's a warrior who will bring world peace, who will Come defeat the that. enemies of Israel. Come on with that. And of course, you know, there's um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, those who will say that that's the second time, but, you know, when Jews say it's the first time. Um, so the point is, why didn't they say that? And I don't have an answer to that, why they didn't say that. But here, it really made me think about one, you know, an issue which, which I, I'd like to bring up, which is that um, you know, a lot of times I'll hear these people who, um, who engage in what's called uh, apologetics on the Christian side and on the Jewish that side. That sounds they, like a nice term for yeah, apologetics. Well, apologetics is actually just yeah. old, old Greek for defense. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and then the Jew, Jews prefer to use the term uh, anti-missionary or counter-missionary. And their position is we're not defending ourselves but we are countering the missionary attempts to convert Jews. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I've seen these debates between very learned people who will have these, you know, apologetic, you know, missionary, counter-missionary debates. And, and I walk away from these things and I say, you know, I just don't think this is the way to find the truth. Because if I'm trying to find the truth, I can make a really good, I'm a, I'm a clever guy, I can make really good arguments. I can make you know some wonderful you're arguments. Saying if you're trying to find the truth, or are you saying? Well, I'm if sorry. You're trying to bet- if I'm trying to win a debate, now you're talking. Right, so let okay, me correct yeah. that. If I'm trying to win a debate, I can say some really clever things and make some really good arguments. But then when you walk away from the debate, you have you know it's like there's that scene in the New Testament where they said to you know Yeshua, "That's what you told them. What do you tell us?" <laughs> and there's actually stories like that with the rabbis, where the rabbi would give an answer, and his disciples would you know take him aside afterwards and say, "Yeah, that was what you told those guys. What's the real answer? We know that's not the real answer. That was great for the debate, for the polemic, for the apologetic. But what's the truth? Mm-hmm. And that's what I want to you know challenge people that I feel challenged myself. I don't want to win a debate. I want to know what the truth of the Creator of the universe is, and if that means that." Um, I have to consider other perspectives and other possibilities. I don't have a problem with that. And I feel, and you know, when I look at this passage and I say, why wouldn't we say this is referring to the Messiah? Whoever the Messiah is, based on other passages, he fits the bill right here. Well, I'll tell you what, here I thought you were going to have to get out the clean. I was about to put you in a corner and and, and just, I was just, I was going to push, push, push. And instead, you just, uh, you brought it out. And it's like, listen, 
what's the issue? The w- issue of winning the debate, debate versus finding the truth. Yeah. They're not always the same, are they? Yeah, and I could give you a long list of examples, but I won't at the moment. Yeah. But really, the, if you look at a lot of these arguments from the Christians and the and the you know the apologetics and the and the Jewish counter missionaries, I mean, they say things where I know their disciples take them aside afterwards and they say, Rabbi. That's what you told the Christian, but what, what does it really mean? Come on, I, I know that's not what it that's means. That's powerful, Nehemiah. Can, can I can I continue? That's Bavakasha. that's very powerful. So we have that section there, and he says the islands have. Uh, no, actually, we want to go to verse four because I think this is <laughs> I love this, verse four. Verse four. <laughs> Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, Yehovah, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am He. And now, look, this is another thing that suggests that this isn't Abraham. Because the whole point of his prophecy here, and this is a theme throughout Isaiah, is how do you know I'm the real God? Because I told, the, I, I, I foretold the future. Mm-hmm. That's Isaiah 40 through 66. This uh, section of the consolation mm-hmm. is predictions of the future where there's going to be some kind of redemption. There was a redemption with Cyrus. There'll be a final redemption, both you know the new heavens and new earth mm-hmm. in Isaiah 66. So the point is there will be this final redemption. And I think that's what this is talking about. There's some going to be some end times war that's described in other places. Mm-hmm. The Messiah is going to get involved. The king from the line of David, who is going to be called awoken from the east. I don't know what that means. He's going to be awoken from the east. But it's what it says in verse 2. Mm. And he's going to come with salvation. And he's going to defeat and subjugate these kings. And um, and Yehovah is now saying, when that happens, you're going to know I'm the true God. Because I told you about it 3,000 years ago. <laughs> I think that's amazing. I Isn't think it? that's amazing. So here's the deal, Nehemiah. We're, we... We've got all this left to do, and we, we've only got, you know, we don't have a, we don't have a boatload of time. What we did with the, the original Torah pearls is sometimes we go two hours. Actually, one episode, I think we recorded three hours, yeah, and, and like I, after editing, it was yeah, two and a half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's do this. Can we, can I keep reading? And, and, and then, and then uh, keep reading. Sure. And, and then we'll, and we're going to get just about, about the halfway part. Wait, no, but we've got to talk about the end of verse four. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Where he says, I, I am he, mm-hmm. the first and with the last, I yes, am he. Yes. And what's interesting is with the last ones is what it literally says, mm-hmm. Achulonim, in the mm-hmm. plural. Um, so what, what do you think of when, I, when you hear that verse? Give it when to me straight. Says, when he says, I am he? Well, well I he mean, says, I am the first and I am with the last. What, what, what's the immediate association? You have? My first, no, nah, I'm just going to tell you what this I do. My, yeah. my, my first thought now is because of this issue of knowing his name. He was, he is, and he shall be. Uh-huh. So that he fulfills yeah. the past, the present, and the future. You know, if you'd asked mm-hmm. me that 10 years ago, I would have probably taken you maybe to, uh, you know, Revelation. Oh, or let's something. look at Revelation. Before we get to Revelation, before you run ahead to Revelation. So just just again, for the people who, who haven't read your book, Is Hell Name Revealed Again, who mm-hmm. haven't read mm-hmm. Shattering Conspiracy of Silence, my book, um, and don't know any Hebrew. Um, the name Yehovah actually grammatically means Hayah Hovei He was, he is, who, he, he who will be. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to the Jews out there who have gone to synagogue, and I'm not telling you anything new. Everybody knows that mm-hmm. in, in the Jewish world. But for those who don't, that's actually the meaning of the name. Hayahovah, yeah, that's mm-hmm. of the name Yehovah. It's a mm-hmm. combination of three forms of the Hebrew verb. Mm-hmm. And you're right. When you hear, uh, I am the first and I am with the last, that is, and we hear he's the eternal God, mm-hmm. you know, Elohe Olam, there's definitely that association between his name and this description of him. Yeah. Now, there's two other passages in Isaiah that this also brings to mind for me. One's Isaiah 44, 6. It says, Thus says Yehovah, the King of Israel, and its Redeemer, Yehovah of hosts, Ani Rishon Vani Acharon. I am the first and mm. I am the last. In our verse, it said, I am with the last. Here he's saying, I am the last. Amen. Elohim, And besides me, there is no God. Amen. Now, in the context of Isaiah 44, he's speaking, I believe, to the Zoroastrians. Um, they were people who believed there were two gods and lots of demigods mm-hmm. and lower gods. Mm-hmm. And he's saying to them, guess what? I'm the only game in town. There mm-hmm. are no other gods. I'm the first one. I'm the last one. Mm-hmm. Um, and that actually has to do with Zoroastrian uh, mm-hmm. theology. Well, let's not get into that now. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 48, 12. Hear me, Jacob, and Israel, who I call, uh, who is called, but uh, called by me. I am He. I am the first, and even I am the last. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So again, I am the first, and I am the last. Mm-hmm. So here we have two, you know, three passages. Two where it's really clear: Jehovah is the first and the last. Um, and then, of course, you said Revelation. I think we should look at that because a lot of our listeners may be thinking of that. And mm-hmm. what does it say there? So. Mm-hmm. Pull so, up on my little Bible here in the computer. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, Revelation. So the, the, what's the interesting yeah. about it is that uh, mm-hmm. when we're doing study in the New Testament, which yeah. actually you challenged me on the issue of trying to look at the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, yeah. was the first time I really re- ever really had had thought deeply about 
the the possibility of a source of a Hebrew source beyond the Greek source. When I was in yeah. seminary, we, Greek was like king, and, and Hebrew was mm. a, was an add on. Uh, to think that in the New Testament there were there were way, there were actual manuscripts that that were originally in Hebrew. Yeah. One of those that's been discussed and, and argued yeah. is the Book of Revelation because of its right. images and its words that are in that. Right. Even as Hebrew words like Abaddon, which mm-hmm. is Avadon, mm-hmm. and Armageddon, which is Havmegiddo. Mm-hmm. So there's literally Hebrew words in Revelation, and, and most mm-hmm. scholars or many scholars, I should say. Well, you know, we'll say that Revelation was based on Hebrew sources, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and there's definitely these Hebrew, fr- you know, images here. So, Revelation chapter one, verse eight, um, and of course, I'm looking at this um, as a book written by ancient Jews. This, mm-hmm. You know, my Bible is the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. But it's interesting to see how a- ancient Jews understood God. They say, "I am the Alpha and the Omega, uh, the beginning and the ending." Rishon Achaon, exactly what we just saw, <laughs> saith the Lord, which is and which was. And which is to come, the Almighty. He might as well have said, he I just am said, Yehovah. I, he, he did. <laughs> yeah. No, and think about that. In the Hebrew, he wouldn't have said, saith the Lord. That phrase appears you know, mm-hmm. dozens of times, maybe mm-hmm. hundreds of times in the mm-hmm. Tanakh. And whenever we see in the English, saith the Lord, that's also always either Amal Yehovah, say, says Yehovah, or Neum Yehovah, speaks Yehovah. Yehovah. Um, and that in the English and the Greek becomes, you know, saith the Lord. Mm-hmm. And then he says, you know, so basically it's saying Neum Yehovah or Amal Yehovah, Hoveh. Haya Yihye. <laughs> Those three forms of the Hebrew verb, they're right here in Revelation, but translated into Greek. And in the Greek, you know, it's which is to come, but that's just the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew, Yihye, he will he be. Exactly. He, which, he that is to come. So it's actually a translation of his name right here mm. in Revelation uh, based on the Hebrew. Um, and then there's two other passages, uh, the fourth, but look at two others. Mm. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega. Now we're not the first ones to tell you this at alpha and the omega. Mm-hmm. Those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Mm-hmm. And if, you know, if this was based on a Hebrew source, it probably would have been, I am Aleph and I am Tav, mm-hmm. um, the beginning and the end, in case you didn't know what that meant. And then he says, the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. I mean, that's right out of Isaiah. We read it last week oh, about giving the water. Mm-hmm. Um, Revelation 22, 13, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So three times in Isaiah, three times in Revelation, we got six witnesses. Yehovah is Harishon, Acharon, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Tav. Wow. <laughs> Amen. Okay, the islands have seen it in fear. The ends of the earth tremble. They approach and come forward. Each helps the other and says to his brother, be strong. I said to you before we were trying to do this, I said to look up Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Yeah. He says, be strong and be courageous. And being courageous, you were argue, we were discussing about whether this is the positive or the negative. You brought up a really good point yeah. about that. In context, is this a ne- is this the brothers of the negative or the, brother, the brothers of the positive? That's a, that's a really good point. So verse 7 is yeah. obviously the bad guys. They're making idols. Mm-hmm. Verse 5 is the bad guys. It's the nation seeing and they're being afraid of this mm-hmm. man called from the east. Mm-hmm. And they're coming to battle. So verse 6, is this a dialogue? Meaning verse 5 is the bad guys. Verse mm-hmm. 6, the good guys. Verse 7, the bad guys. And often that will happen in the prophets. And, and, mm-hmm. and, I, and I imagine, and I don't know for sure, but I imagine Isaiah standing in the public square would have maybe, when he was proclaiming this, they would have been able to tell from his voice. You know, which side is being spoken here? Side. Exactly. But of course, now that it's written down, we've got to understand it from the context the best that we know how. Mm-hmm. So the man saying to his fellow, they will help. And the brother, and, and to his brother, he will say, Chazak, be Chazak, strong. Be strong. So are those the, the, the islands, the enemies of this man called from the east? Or are those the, well, the can righteous? I, bring it I don't know. Can I bring it yeah. till today? I, I, I want to speak to my sisters and my brothers out there. Yeah that are really, really, really in the process. They're in walking. They're wanting to learn. They're wanting to understand the language, history, and context of Scripture. I want to say to them, Chazach. Chazach. Yeah. Be strong. Be strong. Be strong. And even if we don't take it from this verse, like you said in Isaiah, or mm-hmm. excuse me, in Joshua and in mm-hmm. Deuteronomy, mm-hmm. there's this image, Chazach ve'amatz, yes. which means be strong and courageous. And I love in Joshua, the passage you read the first time we did this, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's, there it has two meanings. In, in subsequent mm-hmm. verses, in one verse, it's talking about be strong and courageous in battle against the Canaanites. Mm-hmm. And a couple of verses later, it's being strong and courageous in keeping the Torah. Mm-hmm. Do not let this that book of the, is do not let the, book of the Torah is that powerful? depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night. Now, we've been meditating on this all day. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and it's already night. And it's deep into the night. And it's deep into the night. Can yeah. we continue now? Awesome. It says here... Um, it, it says, uh, let's see, uh, the craftsman encourages the goldsmith, he who smooths with a hammer, spurs on him who strikes the anvil. He says to the welding, it is good. He nails down the idol so it will not topple. That image, again, shows up different times in scripture. Times, Jeremiah yeah. talks about it mm-hmm. where people, you know, they have these idols. And again, the challenge is 
uh, to realize that they're idols, that they're not God, though they people right. have made them into gods well, that do not speak, that do not yeah. live, do not breathe, they're not real. Um, people set them up, and honestly, there's many idols that get set up in people's individual lives. Well, and so this is the point of the passage that um, he's saying he's going to call this one from the east who's going to defeat the enemies of God, mm -hmm. and those people are going to be trusting in their own idols, not in the one true God. Mm -hmm. I'm going to now do what I call Nehemiah a quick little break because um, we are we are in the midst of some exciting exciting things, mm -hmm. and I'm yeah. just going to put this out right now to people that are listening. Yeah. Um, you know, you you challenged us on the tour uh, on talking about the, the marketplace of, of ideas. Yeah. I talked about this before. And I, I want I, I want to lean into this. I want to give an opportunity for you each time. I'd like you to give me an opportunity each time to bring people up to date in terms of what we're doing beyond this. So can, let's time for the ministry minute. Ministry minute. Can you just uh, share a little bit about what's going on with your ministry? Yeah. So my ministry, we each have different ministries. Mine is called Makor, M-A-K-O-R, Makor Hebrew Foundation. And my website is nehemiahswall.com. I know mm -hmm. it's confusing for some people. Um, Nehemiah's wall, that's not a Facebook wall. That's the wall that Nehemiah built yes. in, in, uh, and in biblical is, times. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, it was interesting. I was at the health club uh, not far from, from your house. And, and uh, when I first went in there, I told him my name is Nehemiah. And he said, what kind of name is that? And I said, well, it's like the guy in the Bible who built the wall. About a month later, I was in there. And I walked in and he said to his colleague, you know, he's named after the man who built the wall. And then he said, like, like in that movie, World War Z. <laughs> And I look up the scene because I don't remember that movie. I didn't see it. And they actually built this wall to keep the zombies out. And, and what a powerful image, though, mm -hmm. that the enemy is trying to get in and he builds the wall to protect the faithful. Mm -hmm. Well, so in my ministry, we're doing a bunch of things. Um, we, we've got the uh, monthly Q&A that we're starting. We encourage people to send in questions and we'll, you know, we'll be able to answer all of them. But we'll definitely do some kind mm -hmm. of teaching on uh, some of these you know, Q&A that we get all the time. Um, another thing is we've got what I call the support team studies. There's some exciting things going on in that. Go to nehemiahswall.com to find out more. And one of the really exciting things for me is um, there, you know, my book has been translated, uh, The Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. And the book we wrote together, A Prayer to Our Father, they're both translated into Chinese. But the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus book has been translated into, also in addition to Chinese, Spanish, a language called Serbo-Croatian, not even sure what that is, Icelandic. Um, recently it was translated into Urdu, and the video that goes with it was translated into Romanian, mm. um, and they're talking about doing a translation of the book into, into Russian. And those last three projects, the Romanian, the Urdu, and, and the Russian book, are things that we are trying to raise resources mm -hmm. for. That um, you know, this is one of the projects we're doing in the ministry. Mm -hmm. That you know, you've got to pay people to print books and publish books and, and make translations. And and I should say, like you know, from these <laughs> translations, I don't make a single penny. Mm -hmm. But it's important for me to get this message out. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'd like to take a ministry minute. Uh, other than the fact that we've canceled uh, Halloween for the second year in a row, BFA International. We're a killjoy. <laughs> killjoy. So uh, one of the things that I'm very, very excited about, and I want to be really, really clear with people. Um, my goal is to do exactly what our mission is, and the mission is to inspire people around the world to build a biblical foundation for their faith. So the things that I'm working on now through the BFA Scripture Bites, which is, by the way, Nehemiah, you win the award. I'm gonna let. <laughs> You win the award for sharing that. So many people that responded to, to your sharing that. It's available on the front page of BFAinternational.com. What I really am hoping that people will come in, and there are three levels to the ministry. One, the free. The person just comes. They don't do anything. They don't register. Sometimes people make fun of us about registering. Oh, they don't no registration. But the blessing is there's a lot of people who come and they see something. They don't have to do anything. The free members get access to more information. So, for example, we have a PDF for the Scripture Bites where if you're a free member, you, you, you just register, you're a free member, you can actually get a written PDF that connects with Scripture Bites, which is a new thing that we're in the midst of right now. I think it's week three right now. Ten-part series on the Ten Commandments. Again, Nehemia, thank you so much for that. Uh, but also, premium content, and that's the one that you, you and I used to have go back and forth. What's this premium content? Now you understand it. No, the, it's, well, the yeah. idea, it's the idea that we're giving people something, but also they're helping us to be able to build the foundation for the other things that are coming. We've got things right now that are in the queue that it's just a matter of a little provision and we would be able to do some amazing things. So at least I'm challenging you folks to go to BFAinternational.com, see what's available. You certainly no pressure, but if you would choose to step in with us, like I like to say, rather than a few people doing a lot, if everyone does a little, we can do something great. So that's my ministry minute yeah. and I appreciate and, that. And you know, I, I've seen like the you know the costs involved in some of these things and, and you know like just the example you said of scripture bites, which has been shared um, as of this uh, recording by over 500 people. More than um, that, plus the BFA site. I think right. up to Man. 700 people wow. have shared it on social right. media. Right. They've shared it. And it's been yeah. seen by, I believe, something like 40,000 people, which, yeah. which blows my mind. 
Um, and that's in a short week. I mean, my Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus video has been seen by like 250,000 people. Wow. But that's in 10 years. That's amazing. That's <laughs> and amazing. yours is seen by 40,000. That's impressive. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, and for those who say, well, wait a minute, you should be, um, everything should be free. Um, you know, the people who, who criticize you for that, um, you know, my response to that is, you know, first of all, things cost money. And secondly, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of hours of, uh, of audio, yeah. video, yeah. and hundreds of pages of books that are free, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and if and if that's all you can act, you know, want to access, that's fine. That's fine. Um, and look, I also get people all the time who say, "Look, I can't afford your book. I send it to it for free." Oh, we've been doing that for we, yeah. we've always done that, and I think people realize that we've offered things. But I, I want to say every t every time we do profit pros, let's yeah. take a minute to just share where we're at because we're going to be yeah. around the world. There's going to be things going on over the next year yeah. that people want to hear about. Make sure that you sign up for Nehemiah's newsletter. They can go to NehemiahsWall.com. Yep, NehemiahsWall.com on the right-hand side. Sign up for the newsletter. Yep. Get updates about the new moon, which we had just this past Shabbat mm -hmm. and other exciting And, of things. course, BFA, BFAinternational.com. Same thing, always available for you. Let's move on, Nehemiah. We're yeah. already all the way up to, I believe, here we are to... We are at uh, 11... Well, no, 11's not part of the section. <laughs> no, 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 41, 41. Um, blah, 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 41, yeah, okay, yeah, no, 11 is part of the section. Thank you, oh, you <laughs> scared me. No, it okay. goes to verse 16. Yeah, okay. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies again, and this wait, is wait, amazing, wait. we missed something. What happened something. to verse 8? We, we missed 8, we eight. missed 8, we've no, got to go back to 8. got to go to 8. But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, your descendants of Abraham, my friend. I it literally that. says, oh, Havi, the one I love. Yeah, the one I love. And and this is probably why the rabbis, by this principle they have of juxtaposition, you know, two things next to each other. So the last one was Abraham, mm -hmm. even though Abraham's nowhere to be found in the passage. Um, but definitely there is a message here about Abraham. Why is he mentioning Abraham here? Mm. What does Abraham have to do with it? Well, what's, I, I, well, first of all, we did, we did say this earlier. The reason this section was... was Selected. When we're talking about the third right, section, right. we're dealing with Abraham, which is yeah, Lech Lecha. I'm going Lech Lecha. So why is he? Why Genesis is he? 12. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but why is he mentioning here Abraham? So what's what's the function of Abraham in this passage? Um, and I think to me it's pretty clear. So Abraham had faith, mm -hmm. and Abraham trusted him, and Abraham followed him, even though he didn't know where he was going. And that and so this image mm -hmm. of Abraham, who I loved, is an image of okay. I, I know you're afraid, and that's what he says in verse ten. I know you're afraid. Mm -hmm. I know you're you're you you're worried, mm -hmm. but don't worry. I'm going to take care of you, just like I took care mm -hmm. of Abraham. I'm going to hold you by the hand, mm -hmm. like a father holds a child. Mm -hmm. Trust me, and that's what this is about. And that's what he says in verse nine. Read verse nine. Okay, verse nine. I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest. No, I, I got to stop you. <laughs> okay. What? I took you from the ends of the earth. Is what that's the, the NIV, NIV has. Says. The word is hechzaktiotcha. Mm -hmm. hech, uh, excuse me, hechzakticha, mm -hmm. which is from the word. Same word as chazak, chazak. but as a verb. In this context, this he feel form of the verb, there's seven conjugations mm -hmm. of them called he feel. The he feel form of the verb means to grab hold. Grammar alert, Nehemiah. Come on with the he It's feel. a grammar. No, it's like <laughs> is I grabbed hold of you yes. from the ends of the earth. That's why it's talking about Abraham. Abraham just, I took you from the ends of the earth. No, Abraham. I'm calling you Abraham. Go to the land where I will choose you, to show you. That's what's happening here. And then he says, and from its from its uh, far places, I I called you. That's the second half mm. of the verse, the second half of that phrase in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So we've got I grabbed hold of you and I called you, mm -hmm. and that's why it's about Abraham. Okay, mm -hmm. it's even more obvious in Hebrew. I guess mm -hmm. in English it's really confusing. Yeah, <laughs> you are my servant. I've chosen you and have not rejected you. Right. So that's so okay. So the servant here, I mean, explicitly is Jacob slash Abraham. Mm -hmm. Wow. So do not fear, for I am with you. So do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I love being able to read scripture. I you know, love it's this amazing. verse. Can yes. I read this in Hebrew? Please do that. And, and hey, actually, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're doing tell this the new people. thing. Okay, we're doing this new thing. Uh, this bonus where I'm going to read each section in Hebrew. Um, and we're going to put it up on the website. And I have to give him a lot of credit. He slows down. He reads it. very. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, Nehemiah, it's not an easy thing. Yeah. You do it um, nice and slow and you read it. People can listen to it. We're not expecting yeah. everyone to be able to just know. But they'll pick out a word. Well, even if they there. can't understand it, just beautiful. feeling it and it's hearing it. The way yeah. that the ancient Israelites heard it from the prophet mm -hmm. is, is just so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why I love this verse. I mentioned you know before two years ago, I was really in a, in a dark place. Mm -hmm. And during that dark time, this was a verse that got me through it. This mm -hmm. was a verse that I actually memorized. And it's a long verse. Mm -hmm. Let me read it. Al tira ki imcha ani. Do not fear, for I am with you. Al tishta 
ki'ani elohecha. And that literally means don't look with apprehension, with, with, with fear, mm -hmm. with, with worry. Don't worry, mm -hmm. for I am your God. Imatzticha, I have adopted you. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was really powerful for me. Afazalticha, mm -hmm. and I even help you. Aftmachticha, I even hold you up. Biminsidki, with my righteous right hand. Mm -hmm. And remember we said right, uh, r righteous in this, in this part of Isaiah, according to Professor David Yellen, means salvation. So with my right hand salvation, <laughs> man, this was a verse that got me through yeah, a really dark time. I gotta tell you, Nehemiah, when I, when I hear it, um, it just, uh, it's, it's rhythmic to me. You know, it's, uh, it's powerful. It's poetic. Yeah. It, it speaks, uh, wow. Yeah. Folks, uh, make sure that you, um, that you're, you're reading a couple different translations and, and every once in a while, maybe you've got a keyword study Bible or concordance. See some of those words, pick out those words and get to know those words. In fact, I want to challenge people also. Yeah. To bring questions, you know, when you go to our uh, sites, either of our sites, we'll have this up, and we we en encourage comments. And some of those comments, maybe we can respond to. Yeah. But other people are reading, and other people are listening, and other people can, are. Can are, I read one comment we got? Yeah, that's you know, what I was. You know, we talked about um, how the um, you know there's the missionaries have this one position, the counter missionaries this other position, and each one valiantly wins the debate, depending who you ask. Yeah. Um, but I really don't think that's the way the way to find the truth for, mm. for me. Mm -hmm. I think for me, we can get so much more out of the common ground. Mm -hmm. and, and really, to do that, you, first you need to be confident enough in your faith. If you go into it where you are on the defensive, think about it, apologetics is defense. Mm -hmm. If you go into it on the defensive, then you're not going to always get to the truth. Because you'll always be trying to defend yourself. Before you and, read that, yeah. before you read that, again, I want people to know this. We're not making any promises. Yeah. But, but over time, the reason that I called you Mm -hmm. Nehemiah, the reason yeah. I called you yeah. and asked you about a prophet pearls was off of a comment really? that you responded to. And yeah. I want people to know we take that seriously. I so, didn't know that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So so please, wow. you know, go to both sites, make yeah. comments. If you get a good one, share it on both sites. If, you, if you're yeah. on one, so go ahead and read this. This is amazing. But definitely Nehemiahswell.com. Um, <laughs> so this was a, a, an email I got from a man named Dennis from Chesapeake, Virginia. And he wrote, I want to, uh, and this is after he uh, has listened to the original Torah pearls that we did four years ago. Um, and the current prophet pearls. He says, I want you both to know that the original Torah pearls and prophet pearls are so awesome. The focus on the common ground, Torah, uniting together, focusing on Yehovah. When the day comes, we quit trying to convert others to our beliefs and realize that above all else, studying Torah, learning how to live by Yehovah's instruction, it gives new meaning to you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The money ball as we do it together. Thank you. And that really touched my heart when I, when I got Thank that email. Thank you, Dennis. And it, and it just encouraged me that this, you know, this focus on the common ground rather than I need to win my debate, so I'm going to look mm -hmm. for the best argument. Mm -hmm. And then when we're outside the debate, I'll say something else because, yeah. like, what? Well, I, I, honestly, but I when we focus on the common ground, we don't have to do that. We don't have to be defensive. We can say, I, I'm not afraid you're going to tear down my faith. I know that you're going to build up my faith, and I hope you know I'm going to build up your faith. Because we're striving towards this common ground of the Word of God, mm. Yehovah. Amen. Amen. May it be. Well, it says here, Nehemiah, all who rage against you yeah. will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. That would be nice. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> they find us. I, don't, yeah. I, I can tell some stories about that. <laughs> Those who wage war against you will be nothing at all. For I am Yehovah, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, mm -hmm. do not fear, I will help you. Wow, I love that image. I re and actually, if you look in the earlier passage, <laughs> he says, um, I, 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 I support you, mm -hmm. or I, I hold you up, I support you with my righteous right hand or my right hand of salvation. And, mm -hmm. and if we wanted to get really pedantic and, and split hairs, we could say, well, wait a minute. In verse 10, he's holding with his right hand. But in verse, uh, what is this? In, in this verse, in verse 13, he's holding with his left hand because he's holding our right hand. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you're kind of missing the point there. Yeah, God's going to hold our hand the way a father yeah. holds the hand of the child. Amen. And what I love here is, and, and this is really easy to miss, um, this is another thing I got from Professor David Yellen, um, is that uh, in verses 10 through 16, you have the structure that underlies the Hebrew uh, poetry. Mm -hmm. You have three prophecies or three sections of a prophecy. Mm -hmm. um, and in each section, it has two statements. And it has other statements as well, but there's mm -hmm. two underlying statements. It's a thread throughout these verses. It starts off, Al tira, do not be afraid. And then he says later, Azal I will help you. And, and, and help is such a, a flimsy word. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's not what it means. It's more than help. 
help is I'm going to, you know, when we use this word in English, save, but it has all these theological connotations. Mm -hmm. But if we can use the word save without theological connotations, what he's really saying is, do not be afraid, I will save you. Well, here and I, I'm going to come to your aid. Can I challenge and then the second something? time he yeah. says this, do not be afraid in verse 13, I will save you, I will help you. And again in verse 14, do not be afraid, I will help can you. Can I challenge you on something? Vivaca so we shot. use the word theological? What, yeah. what, is the, what is the meaning of the word theological? Well, I know what it originally meant. But no, I'm asking you what it originally <laughs> so meant. So theos is God and mm -hmm. ology is knowledge, the knowledge of God. Yeah. So, but that's not what theology no, means sure, today. Sure, sure. Let me finish. No, no, no. So, so we talked about this before, how yeah. different terms get taken and right. get used. Yeah. And they get, they, get, they get turned around and they all of a sudden don't mean what they, what they originally meant. Um, yeah. I actually want to start to lean in that a little bit because what mm -hmm. I want to know is how does God think? You know, what is God's, what is God's thoughts? What is God's, and, and the word of God is where we find that. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So in, a, in effect, we've always said we stay away from theology. We stay away from theology that's being used to be pushed on and to be, and to change the meaning of scripture. But we don't stay away from theology in terms of the, its original meaning, the idea of God's thought process and what he, you know, I mean, that's, that's the beautiful thing that I. Well, I, so, I like. so you went to seminary and I'm sure you had a class on systematic theology. Oh, and right? I hated it. And systematic oh, it was the worst theology. Class I, did that? How how often did they crack the Bible in systematic theology? <laughs> what are you talking about? The Bible was the book. It's called systematic theology. No, but the it actual was, Tanakh, no, or, or the New Testament. Even. It was, was that ever opened? That was the book. Systematic. Theology. <laughs> so the book is called systematic theology. Exactly, yeah. And what it does is it tries to develop this theological, um, you know, pattern system. system and, yeah. What, that isn't you know? It's not about the many Bible. times it doesn't fit. Many times it doesn't fit. Right. So. Well, because they, what they do yeah. is they 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 figure out the system systematically and then they look for the verses to support it yeah well there's always a method beyond madness a method madness. is to the madness so let me continue reading we're almost done here see i will yeah. make you into a th oh boy it says do not be afraid O worm jacob O little israel and that's again this sort of this yeah. poetic thing that goes back and forth makes a statement and then further explains a statement uh, can, can we talk about this yes. worm and little yeah. israel mm -hmm. so i mean you know what's true today was true three thousand years ago mm -hmm. two thousand seven hundred years ago mm -hmm. when the assyrians had surrounded jerusalem and had hezekiah lo you know uh, locked up like a bird in a cage as, as the king of assyria said mm -hmm. um so it was this little tiny kingdom little tiny kingdom with an invisible god who nobody could see surrounded by the superpower who had more gods than you know you could even count, mm -hmm. and who were made of gold and silver, and you know, mm -hmm. and decked with fine uh, linens and jewelry, and you know, and so we were this little nation. Mm -hmm. And worm is like the you know the, the image is kind of obvious, I think, which is you know the low elitist thing there is. He's you know crawling through the mud, and it, he says, "Don't worry, I know you're a worm, Jacob, and you're a small Israel. Mm -hmm. I I will help you. I myself." I myself, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's really powerful. Yes. Um, you know, and I think about today where Israel is this little country. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to the United Nations and there's, what, over 200 countries or something like that in the UN. And there's this one pariah nation, the nation that's hated by all the other nations. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're God's chosen people. And they give other reasons. But the bottom line is we're God's chosen people. Um and they hate us mm. and it's okay we don't have to be afraid mm -hmm. he's standing on our side holding our hand and we don't know where we're at in terms of history and how it all is going to not ultimately how it's all going to work whether israel is as operating as biblical his, israel all the time but we know israel is israel people from israel the land of israel both both politically uh, socially and especially spiritually that's where i've gotten in trouble is is blessing israel today and the Israel that was yesterday, and can I say something? Yeah. And the Israel that will come. I mean, that God. So you're saying you've gotten in trouble with the replacement theology. People oh, absolutely. Say, the church is the new Israel. Yeah. Well, not only just that. And, I mean, and, and what this, we've read throughout this, the prophets is Israel is Israel. He's never going to give up that, that and, promise and, to Israel. And, and, and what's in and what's in Isaiah here? For I myself will help you. Declares Yehovah, your Redeemer. The Holy One of Israel. And oh, uh, how many times does Holy One of Israel show it up? It appears 31 times. 31 times. How many? 25 Isaiah? of those are in Isaiah. In Isaiah, Holy one, of Israel. Holy one of Israel. I'm going to push you because we're getting close. Yeah. We're actually almost over. See, I yeah. will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp Ooh. with many teeth. you got to stop. <laughs> Wow! So, <laughs> tell us about tell us about what this image is here. Yeah, so of the sledge with many so, teeth. So in Israel, there's this great place actually just outside Jerusalem where they've got um, like a reconstruction of these ancient archaeological um, or ancient agricultural implements. And some of them are actually authentic agric agricultural implements that were used up until the 20th century mm -hmm. before, uh, <laughs> you know, mechanized things got into Israel. Mm -hmm. And so the threshing, so this threshing sledge is something that was, you know, still used in the 20th century by, you know, primitive farmers in Israel. And what it is, 
is it's a it's a slab of wood, a, a big rectangular piece of wood, and at the bottom of the wood are little pieces of flint, mm-hmm. and you sharp pieces of flint that you stick in the bottom, and they, they're attached in there, and then you drag that over the threshing floor, mm-hmm. and what it does is it crushes the wheat, and it separates out the kernel, the grain of the wheat, from the chaff, and then you take what's called a winnowing fork, and you stick it into this big mix of, of wheat and chaff, seed and and, and 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 garbage and you throw it in the air and the wind comes and it blows away the chaff and then the grains that are the good part that you want fall to the ground because they're heavier mm-hmm. and that's the image here he's saying he's going to send israel against the nations like a like a like a, th- a sharp threshing uh mm-hmm. sledge will winnow them. um a new one with 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 sharp you know mm-hmm. actually in hebrew it's double-edged it's really sharp. Mm-hmm. He's going to thresh them and he's going to winnow them. And what's really exciting to me is after Israel's done with the nations, there's going to be the seed that's left over. Mm-hmm. Not all of the nations will be destroyed because they will be righteous among the nations and, and they will be left over afterwards. Hallelujah. <laughs> and may there be a remnant. And But you will rejoice in Yehovah and glory in the Holy One of Israel. Nehemiah, I have to tell you, mm-hmm. I know that we had to do this twice, but it got better each time. <laughs> I really want to tell you that I could talk about the Word of God literally all day. Don't challenge He's me. done it. <laughs> <laughs> We've done it. Folks, I want to tell you, we are really going to always try to do our best to stay with an hour. But every once in a while, we're going to have to go a little bit over because the word of God calls for it. Anything else, Nehemiah, before I bring closure to this? This has uh, been an amazing experience. And again, more than anything, other than you hearing from us, we want you to crack the word of God yourself and start studying yeah, it. And we want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. Amen. So uh, obviously, um, we're, we're, we're excited. If you're not going to say anything, here's what we have to say. So until next week, we pray that you will keep reading, keep listening, and keep watching. Until we meet again, amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For more information, please visit nehemiaswall.com and bfainternational.com.